Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatore, and Todd of Hello. Todd's Workshop. So, um, we we're here with a massive um, Zweihander. First of all, it's a big two-handed sword, isn't it? Yeah. Most of you out there probably would know this as a Zweihander. But there are other names, as I try to mention as often as possible, because they weren't obviously known outside of German-speaking lands as that. They could be known as a Spadone in Italy, or a two-handed sword in England, or a Montante in Spain. Um, so, first of all, tell us a little bit about this, Todd. What, what is it, and who have you made it for? Right. Um, it is uh, Zweihander, I know it as. It is 1.8 metres, 6 foot tall, uh, from tip to the top of the pommel. So that's so I'm six foot and a half an inch. So there we go. Uh, so it's, it is a monster of a beast. Um, it was based on a piece that was sold in Herman Historica about four or five years ago. I could get very very little information on it, so I've got an overall length for it. Um, beyond that, I had no further information, so everything's been scaled as best I can. I got some further information on. Uh, blade thicknesses and transitions from uh, Peter Johnson and Toby Capwell. They just helped me with some information. Uh, and then really it was just scaling it and, and making it. It's for a guy called Nick Miller um, over in the States. He's really into his cutting videos actually. So uh, there will be future videos that he does mm -hmm. of this being used, cutting up tatami and whatever it is. Cool. Um, so so I'll, I'll put a link, I'll put a link below to Nick's, um, Nick's channel and you know, his, this is his sword. Uh, this is going off to him imminently, isn't it? Oh, on so, Friday, yeah, two days. Yeah. So there we go. So I dashed over to make a quick video um, mm. because obviously it's not that often you you make a, one of these sorts of swords. It is. So. It is as often as once. In the oh, first really? One. This yeah, was your this first. First one, yeah. So, um, so the, I guess the ideal question, therefore, is: what were there any surprises? What were the challenges? Tell us about making uh, this thing. Well, I, sometimes when when you make things. You know, you go, oh, no problem at all, and you can just dive into it. Other ones, somehow there's some fear in there somewhere, and you, <laughs> you're always finding a different job to do until really you, you, you have to face up. And, and this was one of those. So my big concern was purely the length, is is it going to fit in my grind shop? Um, because when you're working, you know, can I spell yeah. that? You know, if you're working... Um, this is a sharp as well, we should mention. So this is intended for cutting, isn't it? Yes. So yeah, if, you, if we're handling it somewhat gingerly, that's because it is really sharp. <laughs> it is. So, you know, if you're working on the tip, for instance, um, I can't even hold it now with the whole thing assembled, but you're working on the tip, you've obviously got uh, one and a half metres, five foot in that direction, you've got the end of the tang, and it's just going to tangle with other bits of machinery, with the wall and mm. so on. And then you think, well, you can just move your, your grinder into a different place, and then you want to, you know, polish in a different direction, suddenly everything needs to be moved again. And actually, I was very lucky that if I pulled the grinder into the middle of the room, I literally had this much, this much on each end of the blade. It's a bit like when you're playing snooker or pool yes. in a pub where the room's too small for yeah, it. Yeah. And <laughs> but you can't, you can't pick up a small cue, you, know, you <laughs> can't chop a foot off the end. Uh, so if I pulled the grinder into the middle of the room, then I was just able to do it. So that was my biggest fear, actually, first off. Uh, I simply would have to move my workshop outside, and I didn't have to do that. Making the blade was okay. So these lugs, I started with a, a wider bit of steel and I, I pinched them out and uh, forged them out. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so you didn't cut it, that shape no, out of the slab? No, I didn't. So, so they were pulled out. Um, and then really, it's just making a blade as you, as you always would. Just it's a bit of a monster. I mean, I imagine that's how a lot of the original ones were made, um, probably oh, out from much. the material. of Because they would have been forging them, obviously with grinding as well at later stages. But but it would be very wasteful in terms of material to start with a large piece and cut it out of that. You, you could. I mean, it's just wasteful of labour in a way because not so much material, because what you could do is chisel that out. You know, you could mm. cold chisel that out, hot chisel that out. So you could, you could rough it to form if you wanted, but actually just putting a cut down and folding it out and reforging, it's just going to be a faster way. Um, so that's fine. But you see it on other things. There's... Um, I forget the accession number, but there's a very classic, um, probably Italian basilard that's in the Royal Armoury. It's the one with a very skinny hilt and a very, very wide eye on it. Uh, okay. Eye-shaped Oh, hilt. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that one you can see if you get the bits of paper out and you, yeah. you fold it down, you can see that they've done exactly the same, that they've just chiselled the two forms of the hilt out yeah. um, and folded it out. That's really cool. So, so the size obviously was a challenge. Um, what about the sort of hilt construction? Um, Hill construction again is, is fairly standard. I mean, what's interesting is you've got 45 centimetres, so uh, whatever that is, 18 inches of hilt pretty much. It doesn't really matter what you do. The tang is 8mm thick. Um, okay. It doesn't matter what you do, you're always going to get some flex in it. You know, you're always going to bend it. Right. Uh, so that makes 
it's a little difficult. I'd um, not thought about that before, mm. but actually, yeah, I suppose if a tang is really, really long, just like the blade flexes, the tang flexes as well, doesn't it? it? Even though it's eight millimeters thick. Yeah. And that's a challenge for all of the material that's attached to that because it could crack or flex the... I, I, exactly that. So, so the way the handle is constructed, again, is sort of fairly normal on longer handles, is that you've got a wooden core, which is then completely wrapped in cord and glue. Okay. And then you have the leather over the top because otherwise, yes, you are going to end up getting flexing in it. Mm. And, and you still do to a certain extent. Um, so people often complain about, oh, I've got a clicky handle on my sword or something. Well, mm. if you've got, especially on long swords, if you've got a long tang, mm. the tang flexes. You know, something has to move. Um, so the fact you've got a click in your handle is, well, it's just part of it. You know, you, you get road noise off your tyres on a car. It yeah. would be lovely if it was silent. It's not. So the, um, the guard and the pommel, so this is all model on the original example yeah. that you have photos of from the auction at Hermann Historical, which yeah. is a, a German auction house that specialises in, uh, well, weaponry of all periods, actually, from yeah. the ancient period right the way through to the 19th and even 20th century. Um, but they, hand, they handle and they get through their cell room quite a bit of Renaissance period stuff. Um, and these two-handed swords are generally associated uh, with with Germany, Italy, and debatably Austria as well. Um, and then separately to that, the Montante style is associated with the Iberian Peninsula, so Spain and Portugal, uh, although they tend to be a different style. But this style is probably German-Austrian. Um, in terms of the decoration, it's quite German uh, style decoration, mm, isn't yeah, it? With this much. ribbon, this kind of twisted decoration, we'll have a little bit more look at in a second. Although the overall form of the sword, to me, seems quite Italian, so I don't know. It, it's difficult sometimes to place these two-handed swords. Um, in terms of date, they're usually um, first half of the 1500s, aren't they? They're usually sort of 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Yeah, I think, I think from memory they dated this about 1530. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's slightly problematic in itself. That, I mean, I, I am no expert in two-handed swords anyway. But this sort of double ring arrangement yeah. here, you see it on the, I think they're a little later often, but the almost blacksmith guarded ones, you mm. know, where, where the, you can literally see it's, it's blacksmith scroll work on the guard. Yeah. You see the double rings on that a fair bit, but these sort of prettier, more swordy ones and less blacksmithy ones. Yeah. Um, I've not seen another double ring one like this. So. I've seen them in art, and I'm pretty sure, I'd have to look back at my archive, but I'm pretty sure I have seen originals with double mm. rings. But this is quite an ornate one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, with with the with the twisted decoration, the spiral on the um, end terminal points of the quillons, and these little um, squares on here. It's mm. quite um, quite intricate, um, and the inner guard is um, smooth. I guess for a couple of reasons. One, because it would be even more difficult to work that inner ring, wouldn't it, to get to it? Cl cleaning up, it would. Yeah, I mean. I probably approach it slightly differently in that what I do is I make each element and I completely finish it and polish it and then I weld it into place and then I clean up the mess I've made. Um, I must confess that I, I weld it electrically. Uh -huh. They would have done it on a forge obviously, in which case the whole piece is getting heated up and the whole piece is getting scaled mm. and messed up again. So yes, if you were working onto the inside of these inner rings, it, it would complicate your life a lot. Yeah. But I, and I think there's another another reason for having the smooth. So if we just look at um, the inside of here, so you can see that we've got the rhythm decoration um, on the quillons at the for the outer parts, should we say, and then on the outer part of these um, side rings. But the inner part of the quillons and the inner rings are smooth. And if you think about that ergonomically from a practical point of view, that makes complete sense because that's the bit that your hand is going to rub against. Mm, so you, you wouldn't really want this type of abra potentially abrasive decoration right against your hand. You want it to be fairly smooth against your hand. Additionally, of course, from the outward appearance, people don't really see those inner bits. Mm. They see the outer bits. So yeah. they're the bits you want to show off and have the decoration on. The pommel it follows the same decoration, doesn't it? So it's, it's, it's twisted um, very much in the same way that the uh, quillons and the uh, side rings are. Was that, how was that to make? Because it's a big lump of steel, isn't it? Uh, well, I, I was making this, it was really, really hot here this summer in the UK, and I was making it, um, well, for us, hot, yeah. in 36, 37 centigrade yeah. temperatures. It was just an awful lot of very, very hot filing. So I was there in shorts, no t-shirt, you know, just pouring with sweat for, I think it was about a day to file that, something like that. Wow, okay. Um, 
So it's a lot of work. Yeah. And in terms of the weights of the components, so we were talking about mm. before, so the total weight of the sword is nearly nine pounds, isn't it? It's a big sword. Yeah, so it's about just a smidge over four kilos. Yeah. Uh, nine pounds, yeah. And I must say, so it is a big sword. Uh, um, I have a, a much lower quality, but I have a, a 200 sword um, that is a similar-ish weight. It's high, sort of eight pounds um, towards nine pounds. And that is quite at the high end of these swords, although this is a particularly big one. I mean, this one's six foot long. A lot of them are only, you mm. know, a, it's kind of half a foot shorter than that. Um, so it is, it is a, a fairly um, high weight for this type of sword. Some of them are more like seven, seven pounds, seven to eight pounds. Um, you do find some narrower bladed types that are even lighter, sort mm. of six and a half pounds. Um, but of that sort of eight point, what is it, eight point nine pounds or something? Yeah, something, yeah. something like that. Um, of that weight, what do the constituent parts weigh roughly of that? Because I, I think, I mean, that guard looks pretty heavy just by itself. Yes, for me. It, it, it is. And uh, talking of the weight, I mean, that's one of the things. There's there's quite a lot of rings in it. Um, it's uh, I think over a linear meter of of steel. Wow. Um, just in that. So uh, yes, there's quite a lot of weight in that. So. From memory, it's a while back I made it. I think the blade was about four, four and a half pounds okay. in weight. Um, so uh, two kilos, mm -hmm. roughly. So about half the weight is the blade itself. Then you've got about another kilo in the guard, about another kilo in the pommel, give or take. And this is from memory. Um, and then you've got another few hundred grams mm. uh, in the handle, maybe another 250, mm -hmm. 300. Uh, and that's how it adds up. So roughly half of the weight yeah. is, is in guard component, guard and pommel. But just to put the, the overall weight into context, it's, it's basically the same sort of weight as you'd expect certain pole arms to be. Mm. Um, the types that have langettes on them. Um, so if we're looking at certain types of larger halberd or beer yeah. or this kind of thing. And in many ways we could liken, liken this to a pole arm in terms of its size and also its function. It's clearly not a sidearm. It's not something you can wear, although we'll talk about that separately. Um, so it's something that has to be carried and it is a primary weapon for specific types of, yeah. of, of soldiers or guards or, or, or such like. Um, so uh, um, I want to ask uh, just a little bit more about the blade, but before mm. we go to that, can you tell me a bit more about the handle? It's quite a distinctive um, design. It's quite big, but it's, it's to me, it reminds me actually of some pole arm, of sort of fancy pole axe mm. um, handles and stuff you sometimes get. Um, but can you tell us a bit about the construction? Uh, yeah, so <coughs> we talked earlier that you've got the wooden core inside, then you've got a cord wrapping over the top of that, and that's really just to hold everything together because, as we said, if you flex the tang, mm. you can end up cutting it because of uh, snapping it because obviously the handle itself is glued in into shells. What type of wood is? Uh, in this, it will be lime. Okay. I imagine is what I usually use. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you can split the glue joint. So you need to bind mm. the whole thing together. And then what happened was we've got a cord overlay, which you can see here uh, mm. under the leather, and that's literally just glued on the surface. It has no no purpose other than decoration and, and grip. It's not a structural mm. purpose. Little tiny sort of chunks of cord which are cut there and then really like glued, the glued in place glued yeah. in place and then the leather was um, very thin veg sand leather and it's just dampened and over the course of an evening you know you sit there with TV and, and <laughs> the grip and you just mold it in with your hand particularly this bit literally you're just fiddling with it for a couple of hours just you soak the leather do you yes and it's yeah. relatively thin veg yes sand. Uh, under a mill Right, um, oh right. And okay. it has to be for something like this. Yeah, to get into all the recesses <coughs> and, yeah. Yeah, and then you just, you start to just sort of massage it in to kind of tell it where it wants to be, you know. It's one way to spend an evening, exactly. massaging wet leather. A lot, <laughs> a lot of my evenings are spent doing similar things or fletching <laughs> bolts or something. Um, and then, and then yes, just, uh, I used wood glue. Um, mm -hmm. And then you, you just press the leather in and as the glue tacks off, you're just pressing it in with a bone into all these places here and, and you just keep doing it and you just go over and over and over. And where the leather laps around, mm. you, do you sort of thin, you thin it, do you? To, yeah, you yeah. skive it down as it's yeah. called. So, um, it's like shaving it almost. Yeah, you just yeah. shave the edge yeah. down and it just helps to stop the ridge yeah. being prominent. But in honesty, with leather that thickness, if, you, if you're pressing it down anyway, you'll more or less smooth out yeah. any junction that you've got. And as well as, um, 
sort of flattening the leather down mm. for durability because you don't want it to be catching. I mean, no, exactly. You see some less well-made swords where there's more of a lip mm. um, with that overlap and it just it peels away with you, use. You know it's going to. But frankly, it also wears on your hands. Yeah. It's quite an unpleasant mm. feeling because you can feel that ridge. So yeah, it's great. Mm. I, I think with one, so I, I was um, swinging this sword around a little bit um, before we started filming and it is a big weapon. It is a big... Um, weapon to keep hold of and, and control and these ridges and uh, any texture you can get really on the grip is really important mm. actually with a weapon of this size so whilst you might not have this layer of texture on a, a smaller sword you know a sight an arming sword or a, um, a long sword you really need it with a weapon of this size and it's one of the reasons that you see things like studs on halberd shafts for example because you need that level of friction to keep a hold yeah. of a weapon of that kind of weight and size. Um, but that being said, the point of balance is actually quite far back, isn't it? It's relatively close. I think it's about there. Yeah, it's about halfway between the langers yeah. and the... Uh, so you can, guard. you know, obviously I'm not, because uh, I want to stay within camera shot, I'm not going to move around here and I don't want to hit Todd uh, with it, but just wiggling it, as it were, you can see that despite the fact that it's nearly a nine pound weapon, you can move the tip quite quickly and quite mm. easily. Um, so to give well, I would say minor cuts within the context of this weapon, but actually something which yeah. would do quite a lot of damage to a lump of meat. Um, you can do that really quite easily. Um, so the final thing I wanted to ask was, um, I know that um, with long blades you can come into challenges to do with heat treatment. Mm. Was, that, was that a challenge with a blade of this size? Um, finding somebody who could do it, because that's not some. I can't treat a blade this length here. Um, so what you've got are... A few things going on. One is uh, to obviously get the temperatures correct and, and the actual processing of it. Um, so finding somebody who can do that length, that's one thing. Then the other is, is that you can get sabering, as it's called. So it, it, it curves in the, the flat of the blade, um, and then which is less common but is extremely problematic if you get it. Um, and then the other is that it, it curves into the uh, along the flat of the blade, which yeah. is much more common. Um, if it, because obviously if it curves in the in the plane of the edge, you can't really straighten that very easily. Can um, you? I did with the rapier recently, okay. and the, okay. but that's thin enough. But that's not no, forty to fifty mil. Thirty board. So yeah. um, that would be very problematic to do. Mm. Um, but no, it came back with a, a little bit of warping, if I remember rightly, but not much. So the tip was out maybe an inch or something. But that's you can just warm up as long as you keep within temper temperature. You can just warm it up and bend it, and very occasionally one breaks generally they don't mm. um so uh i've never had one go actually um be heartbreaking if it did because uh, oh, <laughs> uh, um oh uh, what's his surname uh there's an american smith called Jesus, um or he works in america uh, -huh. uh he was making a pattern world of blade and if the story if i remember the story it was something like four years of development <laughs> and, and processing to get to the point and it was extraordinary and he broke it oh. um <laughs> but there you go. Straightening, uh, straightening, straightening out, it. Uh, straightening yeah. it. Um, but everyone knows that's a vulnerable it's, it's moment. A, it's isn't a vulnerable it? moment. Yeah. So actually, it came back from the heat treaters pretty darn good, in honesty, okay. and it just needed a little bit of tickling to get it straight. Um, cool. So, yeah. Okay, so um, well, we'll wrap up there for this video, but um, I'm looking forward to seeing this sword in use. Yes, um, so I am. Yeah. And I'll post the link below to uh, Nick, Nick, Miller, Nick yeah. Miller's channel. Um, so, Nick. Well done, you've got a lovely sword here. I hope you enjoy it. Mm. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you chop up with it. Um, but thank you very much, Todd. Yeah, and uh, we'll see you again for the next video. Thank you. Cheers, folks. <laughs>